Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. Today's video sponsored by Audible. You can start listening with a free 30-day Audible trial and get full access to thousands and thousands of all you can listen audiobooks, original entertainment and podcasts included in the Plus catalogue. Visit audible.com slash jingles or just text jingles to 500, 500 and you can start listening today. Which means it's time for my audiobook recommendation for April, and this month it's going to go to The Prefect by Alastair Reynolds. He's one of my favourite all-time ever hard science fiction authors. And The Prefect is set in his famous Revelation Space universe. Although it's one of the later books that he wrote, it is set right at the beginning of the Revelation Space timeline. It follows the story of a law enforcement agent known as a Prefect who operates out of what's called the Glitter Band, a ring of orbital habitats in orbit around a planet that goes by the name of Yellowstone. The story begins with the Prefect investigating an attack on one of the habitats that left 900 people dead, but during the course of investigations he uncovers a potential threat that could lead to the entire destruction of the Glitter Band, and without wanting to give any spoilers away, it sets up the situation for all of his earlier Revelation Space books and answers the question what exactly was it that happened to the planet Yellowstone and the glitter band that surrounded it and as such it serves as a perfect prequel to his other Revelation Space books and it's a fantastic story in its own right. So that's The Prefect by Alastair Reynolds, my audiobook recommendation for April. As always Head over to audible.com slash jingles using code jingles or just text jingles to 500, 500 And of course, if any of you have any other recommendations for good audiobooks that people can use their first monthly free credit on, then by all means, let's hear them in the comments. So, on with the show. Uh, this is Zenite in the Japanese Tier 6 destroyer, the Fubuki. It's a Tier 7 battle, so he's not top tier, he's not bottom tier. Nothing wrong with the matchmaking. And I've just realised he's divisioned up with Kevaseeb in the heavy area there. I've watched his live stream. Check this out, rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous. We're going to have a few busy minutes at the start of this battle, starting around about now. I was actually expecting the enemy Maestral there to disengage rather than fight two destroyers at the same time. And potentially more than that, but no, he's going for it. Although it looks like he is trying to smoke up. I mean, the Aviere is kind of like the Fubuki in that it doesn't hit often, but it does hit hard. Zenite very wisely evacuating his smoke screen once he initially managed to disengage because smoke screens are torpedo magnets. And judging at the speed that that smoke screen is moving, it looks like the Maestral is not disengaging. No, he's going balls deep. He knows he's got two destroyers to fight here, and not just one, right? Well, actually, he's just managed to sink Kevaseeb, so yeah. He does only have the one destroyer to fight, although somebody else on the team is also shooting at him, and he's probably not going to make it into cover on the far side of that island, but speaking of fighting two destroyers at the same time, suddenly a wild gator appears, backed up by a Monticaccioli, and between the two of them, they absolutely rip Zenite a new arsehole. Although, the Maestral did not get away with it. The Prince Heinrich's secondaries finished him off. But Zenite is in a lot of trouble here. And it's getting worse. He's used his damage control, and then right before he managed to disengage, he got hit again with high explosive, which has set what is now a permanent fire. So, he's got no health. He's a tier 6 destroyer, so he obviously doesn't have a heal. And he's going to have less health by the time that fire runs out. So he, he's had an interesting start to the battle. <laughs> Which is a shame because looking at the matchmaking, it would be difficult to get a better matchup for a tier 6 torpedo destroyer than this. I mean, the only way this could have been better would have been if this was a tier 6 battle and he was top tier. Because there are no aircraft carriers. Oh, hello, Mr. Torpedo. That was nice. Um... There are no submarines, and there is no radar. So, ideal starting conditions for a torpedo destroyer like the Fubuki. Unfortunately, he just lost 85% of his health in the first three minutes of the battle. So, that's a bit of a shame. 
although that's possibly the biggest understatement since the commander of the Gloucestershire Regiment on the 23rd of April 1951 during the Korean War while being overrun, running out of ammunition and engaged in desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting on Hill 235 reported that things were getting a bit sticky. I suppose if the colonel had just stopped being British for a minute and instead said, help, help, we're being overrun, his American commander would have probably sent some help and 522 of them wouldn't have ended up being taken prisoner the next day. But what are you going to do? Well, it looks like between the war spite up there and the Prince Heinrich secondaries, they're going to nail that gator, but it's almost certainly going to cost them the war spite, which means Zenite is about to run out of division mates. Honest question here, how many of you just stopped to check your Android phone? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that one was mine. <laughs> I thought I'd just leave it in and see what happens. That's right, I am a trickster YouTuber. <laughs> Messing around with my audience. Sorry about that. Well, I'm not sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, what can I say? This can be a dull job. You have to take your amusement where you can find it. Anyway. You know, despite the early losses and the, you know, catastrophic loss of health in the first three minutes, this is actually looking like not that bad of a game. Zenite's team have two of the caps for making progress on a third, and they're actually ahead on kills. Although they did just lose a Gneiser now, but it looks like Zenite's torpedoes, there it is, just claimed revenge on the King George V. So the enemy team are down to 150 points. I mean, they've got a 300 point lead in two of the three caps. The King George V did manage to finish burning down the war spy, but it's battleship for battleship, it's a points neutral exchange. This is actually looking pretty good. And then... <laughs> it's more or less at this point where what was looking pretty good starts looking horribly, horribly wrong. The enemy team just sank two ships in quick succession. They're contesting the central cap. And Zenite's team still haven't managed to claim possession of the cap over at Alpha. So what was a 300 point lead just a couple of seconds ago momentarily dropped down to a 100 point lead. And until the friendly Eendracht managed to get an airstrike off on the enemy Kotovsky, the enemy team were actually one kill ahead. It's funny how quickly things can turn around in World of Warships, isn't it? I mean, they are still ahead and they do still have points coming in, at least from the cap circle at Charlie. But Bravo's being flipped, and they still haven't taken Alpha, and honestly, I don't think they ever will. Certainly the Kaikdan over there, who's desperately been trying for quite some time, and it's costing him almost all of his health, is probably going to die long before he flips that cap. Although if those torpedoes have anything to do with it, it won't be the Congo that kills him. Come on, baby. Yeah, at least one of those is going to hit, and one is all that it took. It's not going to save the Kaikten, of course. Yeah, there he goes. I mean, sitting in an open cap circle, spotted, even a Gneiser now is going to sink you eventually. And, in fact, did. So. Well, the good news was that the enemy team who were challenging the central cap at Bravo have been driven off, so the team do still hold two of the cap circles. And the enemy team are back down to less than 200 points. But... The kills are even, the enemy team are about to finish flipping Alpha and hopefully reappear through the gap in between those two islands, which is exactly where Zenite is sending his torpedoes, crossing his fingers, his toes and anything else that he can cross that the torpedoes are going to run into something as the majority of the enemy team are over there. They have finished flipping Alpha and they're probably going to be coming this way. Here's the problem though. They have a Naviere, a Mutsuki, a Gneiser now, and a Fiji over there. And those two cruisers, in their rush to get in there and engage the remainder of the enemy team, are basically giving a nice big flat broadside to the Repulse up to the north. And the Repulse is armed with 15-inch guns, and it gets cruiser accuracy. Now, we can only hope that the Repulse is engaged in a gun battle with the Prince Heinrich and the New York also up to the north, because if he's looking this way, those two cruisers are toast. Then again, 
two cruisers rushing into a battleship, a Fiji, and a pair of destroyers probably don't really need any help from the Repulse in order to get their asses handed to them. The Zenite's obviously going to try to do what he can, but yep, sure enough, they've lost the Chungking. The Indracht is still pushing in, although trying to turn away now would be suicide. He'd get his broadside hammered by the Fuji and the Gnaiser now. They're probably, yep, they got the Matsuki. Zenite thought he'd have a sneaky shot there, try to steal the kill. Very wisely uses his smokescreen, because battleships tend to get very, very nervous when they spot destroyers within torpedo distance and should immediately switch fire. Plus, the Gnizer now could be secondary spec. I mean, secondary spec on the Gnizer now isn't the most efficient use of your points, but it can be fun. So you shouldn't be too surprised to see secondary spec Gnizer nows and Scharnhorsts. Although, I mean, you know, the main battery guns on the Gnizer now are useless anyway, so why not spec into secondary? The one good thing here is that German battleships don't start getting hydro until tier 8, with the Bismarck and the Tirpitz. Actually, does the Tirpitz even get it? I'm not sure, but I know the Bismarck does. So, I mean, he's nosed in towards the smokescreen, so he's expecting torpedoes from this direction. And it's probably going to take two to sink him. Oh dear, oh dear. That was... yeah. Not sure why he turned. I mean, it looked like he was making the right decision. Torpedoes come in, present a nice narrow target profile, and then he just turned broadside on to ensure that he ate at least one of them. And now, of course, he's recovering health. And also, they've lost the Eindracht. Because of course they have. That's what you get when you charge four ships at the same time. And you're not in a Kremlin. Or a Petropavlovsk. Or a Stalingrad. Somehow the team are still ahead on points, and those torpedoes are looking pretty good. Oh, he's going to take two. That should be enough to sink him. Oh, they're going to lose the Prince Heinrich. He got YOLO'd by the aviary. But if those torpedoes hit, and they have, it's again a points neutral exchange, battleship for battleship. The thing is, there are only two ships left on Zenite's team. Points neutral exchanges are all well and good. Providing you have more ships than the enemy team, because if you keep exchanging point-for-point point ships and you have less ships, you're going to run out of ships long before you run out of points. So, what are you going to do here? You're 300 points ahead, you have two of the three caps. But the enemy will start flipping Bravo, and there's not a lot you can do to stop them, so you're not going to have two caps for long. The smart money at this point usually says, run away and run the clock down. But, there's more than seven minutes of this game left. And the New York doesn't really do running away. I mean, to his credit, the New York captain has realised that he absolutely definitely needs to try to disengage as best he can, but the, you know, the important word here is try. The New York only has a top speed of 21 knots. And he is going to be getting stalked by that aviere. So he's doing what he can to try to avoid taking any further damage. He's going to try to keep the islands between himself and any potential torpedo threats. And speaking of torpedo threats, Zenite has not only sunk the Fiji with what were pretty much blind torpedoes there, but he's also delayed the process of the enemy team flipping that central cap at Bravo. He hasn't stopped it. There's somebody else in there. But he sank that Fiji, and the Fiji is a very, very dangerous ship. And more importantly, he's put them even further ahead on points. However, with six and a half minutes of the match remaining, and the enemy team now in possession of two of the three caps, is that 400 point lead going to be enough? Javier has managed to get himself spotted. And there's the repulse. Okay, useful information to know. Now the New York should be aware of exactly where he needs to be to get some islands between himself and any torpedoes that the Aviary may be launching. Also, any 15-inch armor-piercing shells that the Repulse may be launching. He's lost sight of the Aviary for the moment, and the New Yorker's launched his spotter plane. That's good. He's trying to reacquire him as a target. This is where Zenite needs to be really careful. Not just because if he gets spotted by that Aviary, he's basically dead. But also, if he blunders into that cap circle too early, 
That's going to tell them where the last surviving destroyer on his team is. And then he's probably also dead, which would give the enemy team all the time in the world they need to catch up to and sink the New York, because the Repulse is an extremely fast battleship. Torpedoes out at the Repulse, and somebody is in the final capture point, and that is obviously going to be the Aviere, who just basically did a drive-by on the New York. Which, you know, thinking about it, absolutely the smart thing to do. Take the cap circle first, then you've got all the time in the world to chase after the sluggish American standard battleship. The Aviere is a pretty fast destroyer, but, well, when you're chasing something as slow as a New York, you don't need to be a pretty fast destroyer. You're gonna catch it. And it's at more or less this point where something rare and magical starts to happen. Not just in World of Warships, but in any team-based multiplayer game. Communication and coordination between the various different members of the team. And not just the two surviving players, the Zenite here in the Fubuki, and the captain of the New York over there. They're also going to get some good advice from the captain of the Prince Heinrich, who stuck around to watch and offer advice after he got sunk. Because Zenite is flipping Bravo. Which does need to be done if you need to avoid confrontation because you've got no health and try to preserve as much points for the team as possible, this cap needs to be flipped. But the New York is nearly here, anyway. And while the Aviary has finished flipping Charlie and will be heading in this direction, and the Repulse seems to be more concerned with avoiding any Fubuki torpedoes than taking any direct part in the battle for the moment, the next best thing for Zenite to do because he's finished flipping Bravo, he didn't actually need any help from the New York, is to leave the New York here as bait and allow him to try to survive as best as he can. And the New York himself has said this in chat. I'll take Bravo, and somebody is flipping it. The Aviere is back. You head over to Alpha. And it's all about buying time, preserving that points lead until the timer runs down. Because the enemy team are really not doing anything wrong here. This is, again, a quite a rare occasion in World of Warships where it's not a case of one team throwing as hard as they possibly can and the other team just benefiting from it. Both teams are actually playing the last quarter of this battle extremely smart. The New York's digging in and preparing to sell his life as dearly as possible. Zenite dropping torpedoes in an attempt to give him as much backup and support as he can, but the most important thing that Zenite can do here, well, it'd be real nice if he could sink the Repulse, but he's probably not going to. Yeah, one torpedo isn't going to do it. So the most important thing that Zenite can do here is not directly support the New York. It's get into this final cap circle. And if he gets the opportunity to torpedo anything in the meantime, you know, great. But the priority is taking this cap buying time for the team, in order for him to win on points. He's still got a smoke screen, and he did just cause a flood on the Repulse. So if he can maybe set a fire, that might be enough to kill the Repulse. Then again, if the New York can ram the Repulse, that would take care of him as well, and again, be a points-neutral exchange. And it looks like the New York is trying, bless him, but, well, it's a Repulse, and he's in a New York, and it's, it's not the most manoeuvrable of ships. And, you know, he did his best. He did what he could. He stayed alive for as long as possible. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to take anybody down with him. But now there's less than 100 points in it, and about a minute and a half to go. And they know, not exactly, where Zenite is, but, you know, they'd have to be pretty stupid to not see the smoke screen, and they're perfectly aware that somebody just flipped Alpha. And here's the thing. The Fubuki's a decent destroyer, but it's not very fast. Only has a top speed of 35 knots. And unless I'm very much mistaken, Zenite doesn't have an engine boost. And here's the thing about the Repulse. It's a battleship with an extremely long duration engine boost. And with that running, it can do nearly 40 knots. Another torpedo hit. Sadly, once again, not enough. The Aviere is an extremely fast destroyer as well, with a base speed of 38. But with the Aviere's engine boost running, and he may still have a couple of charges left because I think it gets six charges by default, that thing can do nearly 50 knots. So 
if Zenite had been doing the standard lurk around inside the smokescreen and try to torpedo them as they come rushing towards you, he would almost certainly be dead because they'd be in his smokescreen and on top of him before he could do anything. Thankfully, he is capable of thinking and breathing at the same time because even though he is in the slowest ship currently in this battle, he's taken advantage of the space and time that he has to ensure that he does not get spotted and end up throwing this at the last second. Aviere there, in sheer desperation, firing his guns just to see whether or not he got detected in order to guesstimate where Zenite's position was. Day late, dollar short. The enemy team didn't really do anything wrong there. This was just one of those rare occasions where the winning team were the one that played the best, rather than the one that made the least number of mistakes, which is not the same thing. So congratulations, obviously, to Zenite for securing the win. Also to the captain of the New York, who did absolutely the best that he could under extremely difficult circumstances. And a special mention to the captain of the Prince Heinrich, who stuck with the team to the end, offering some very good advice wherever possible. Hope you enjoyed today's battle. And as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.